and here we are just like that no more green room and now we're uh up on top so connor will what's going on guys how are you i'm okay. good i'm very good how are you oh man i can't complain i uh connor i was telling will a second ago i, I got off a plane about three hours ago from new york and glad to be back here with the dogs and hanging out so nice we're good yeah you'll probably hear one on the bark in the background somewhere along the line so You'll trigger it. It'll be the whole thing. It'll be like one dog in our building barks and then it just like ripples up and down. Always, always happens. Well, man, looking at uh, everybody joining right now. We got a lot of folks online. Uh, welcome, everybody. We'll give you another minute or so. Get comfortable, relax, grab a water, grab a beer, whatever you need. Uh, and we'll get moving here in a second. But I know we got a 3 p.m. Time. on the East Coast. So and it's Thursday. So beers, beers are allowed. It's officially happy hour. I mean, let's let's be very honest with ourselves. Right. So um, and you're Utah, in the UK, what's it's up, like Ian? almost bedtime. Ian. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Always man. a beautiful day in Utah. Utah is criminally underrated. I love Utah. I spent a it's lot great. of time out there in the winter. So, yeah, uh, I mean, still a lot of snow out there right now from what I can tell. Pure coincidence. I'm actually going to Utah tomorrow. Hey, of all, of all, what are the chances, right? What are the chances? <laughs> what are the chances? I love it. Well, if anybody hey, has any tips for me in the chat, I'd love to hear them. <laughs> oh man, I'll, I'll I'll give you all the tips of uh, either Alta or Snowbird, or I'll tell you all the different mountains and runs you need. So, uh, but for now, we're gonna get kicked off. We got a lot of things to talk about, and uh, and we're gonna get rolling. This is gonna be a fun one. I am really excited about it. Uh, and first and most importantly, for everybody that's on, we've got what, forty plus people already in, and they're still still rolling through. Thank you all for joining. I know everybody's got busy days. Uh, we wouldn't be here jamming out about a really fun and yes, polarizing topic. Uh, if it wasn't for our great community of everybody jumping in. So again, please uh, ask questions. If there's anything to take away from today, be interactive. Uh, we want to be helpful. We want to be uh, giving you some good advice or Connor and Will will be giving you good advice. I'm here to learn as well. But uh, we got a lot to talk about. Before we do all that, we need to know who we're talking to. Connor, I'm going to let you kick us off and uh, introduce yourself. Sure. Uh, what's up, everybody? I'm Connor. Um, I run Aptitude 8, uh, which is a technical consulting firm in the HubSpot ecosystem. So we do implementation, integration, and optimization of the HubSpot platform. Um, and we're doing a lot of really cool stuff on HubSpot. My background sort of pre this. I did a lot of depth in the HubSpot universe uh, and our Salesforce universe. I apologize. A lot of depth in the Salesforce universe. Uh, and we still do a fair amount with sort of HubSpot plus Salesforce in the mix. And then increasingly more and more on the HubSpot platform side. Uh, and then I also run a, a business called Happily, uh, which is a HubSpot Ventures backed app studio that's building products on top of HubSpot. Uh, it's very similar sort of the Salesforce app exchange type of, of model as well. Uh, and so super deep in, in all things HubSpot, HubSpot platform, HubSpot ecosystem, uh, and, and pushing the boundaries of, of what you can build and how. I love it. We're going to talk a lot about Happily here in a second, because I think that's another big piece to how and why we're seeing so much shift and change in the greater HubSpot ecosystem. So Connor, I love it. Uh, I know it's fun. I've, I've known you for so long now. It's, uh, I think it's one of the first times we've actually get to share a screen or share a stage. <laughs> uh, I'm pumped, man. I'm, uh, I appreciate you having here. And I see a lot of folks in the chat right now, a lot of ATLians here. Hey, Bruna. Hey, Carlos. All right. Uh, Will, take it away. Tell us who you are, what you do, and uh, why you're passionate about what you're doing. Hello, folks. It's lovely to meet everybody, uh, for those I haven't met anyway. Uh, I am Will. I'm the Director of Growth at Rev Partners. Um, Rev Partners is in a similar sort of ecosystem space uh, to Aptitude 8. We are a solutions partner for HubSpot. Um, we focus mostly on revenue operations and particularly adoption, visibility and speed to, uh, uh, speed to value uh, within the HubSpot. Uh, side of things. So we're building a lot of products at the moment that are focused on how to quickly and easily get folks engaged and using HubSpot in the best way possible. Um, because we do find that adoption is kind of the key to this uh, to this to this whole CRM piece. Uh, we also uh, we also involved um, in. Uh, a thing called the Hubolution, which we are currently championing, uh, which is exactly what we're talking about today, which is the mass migration of people from Salesforce over to HubSpot. Uh, we, also call it the, uh, we also call it the orange wave uh, because we do think it is a phenomenon that is uh, that is occurring. 
couldn't agree with you more. I think, uh, and look, that's coming from uh, the guy who I will openly admit, I've got the, uh, the big blue black, uh, cloud coursing through my veins uh, from being a Salesforce homer, just from uh, my experience of, of running Salesforces, integrating Salesforce, building a company that sits on top of it, and also having Salesforce as an investor. But that doesn't mean that we're not here to learn about everything else that's going on in this greater ecosystem. At the end of the day, you start to really think about what we're doing, why we're doing what we're doing, both from a consulting angle, from a software angle, from a community angle. Bring it all back to why we're all here and why we've got, now it looks like 50 plus people hanging out, wanting to learn more and hear about why we actually think uh, and starting to see some of these trends of the big orange, what do you call it, big orange wave coming through. Um, yeah, I think to, to set the stage and, and just let everybody know here, um, we want to hear from you. So if you have direct questions, pop them over into the Q&A. That's exactly what we're here to do is make sure that we, uh, we understand everything that, that you want to uh, understand on. Uh, but just as a, a, a background of sorts, and this is where we're going to really kick off uh, in, in question number one, right? Um, HubSpot is a lot different and it looks a lot different over the last 18 months more than it ever has, especially over the last 15 plus years, they've been around. Um, Connor, I'm going to let you start here because you, you you told me about this as we were prepping, but it's fascinating to me about watching this evolution. So if we don't start with the why and, and the what of how we've gotten to here, uh, we're not going to be able to solve anything. So take it away. Tell us what some of these changes are that we've seen in the ecosystem over the last 18 months. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so I think one of the things, especially if you're coming from kind of always being in, in the Salesforce universe, which is really where I I started, right? Is like, you think of HubSpot as HubSpot, the marketing product, and then increasingly like, oh, well, they have this like CRM thing and it, it's not that legitimate. And like the reason for that is really, if you think about the history of the company and the platform. So HubSpot uh, founded in, in 2006 from basically like 06 to 2014, it was a marketing software company. They had a landing page builder, an email tool, a blog tool, all marketing, all marketing focused. And they had the Salesforce integration. It was sort of like the original argument then was sort of like, oh, is it HubSpot or Marketo or Pardot? Which thing do I do? And then from like 2014 to 2017, which I sort of think is like phase two uh, of HubSpot, is HubSpot the SMB growth software. So they launched the first version of Sales Hub, which was really just activity tracking and calendaring, and it didn't do anything else. It was just really basic sales functionality. Uh, lots of people that were using Salesforce at the time were like, hey, put this in your inbox, and it auto captures all your emails, and it logs them to Salesforce, and it's super helpful. And so it's sort of this SMB growth software. And then they launched Service Hub in 2017, and I would sort of consider like from 17 to 21, sort of this SMB CRM product similar to like a Zoho type of solution where kind of focused on SMB, scaling a little bit more into more robust companies, but very basic tooling and functionality for sales, marketing, and service. And then in 2021... I would sort of consider like everything really changed. Um, and the first for sort of wave of that change was the introduction of custom objects. And so all of a sudden you're not just, I use HubSpot, it has these features, I use those features. It's, I have a business, I need a data model that represents that business and HubSpot becomes an option to build that into. Uh, and then the next thing that happened was operations hub and now you can build custom coded actions and extensibility and you're no longer limited to out of the box functionality and what we're starting to see is that level of extensibility is getting higher and higher and higher and higher where you're not really just sort of configuring and setting up an out of the box crm solution you're really tailoring it and building it into what you need for your organization which sort of changes it from i have no idea what i'm doing is there a software that can help me organize and manage it to we have a business process, we have something we're trying to build, and we're looking for a platform that will help us build and scale that process. And I don't think HubSpot was in the ring doing that until 2021. And I think in the last two years, we've seen that accelerate really dramatically. Totally. And we got some, uh, some fans of custom objects over here in the chat right now. And I agree. I think putting my old consulting hat back on, which that thing's got a lot of dust on the shelf somewhere because it's been a while. It's tattered. Time. Yeah, it's, it's, it's been tired. But, you know, going through that, you know, in, in the similar courses that, that y'all are going through, I didn't have that as a, as a luxury or as a way to configure HubSpot when I was doing a lot of my consulting back in the day. And it is, I think, the, the customization and the flexibility that you have to build in a system like this, uh, it is becoming the norm. It has to be there. And it is a great thing to see HubSpot bringing that in to light now. 
Will, curious to get your thoughts too, just watching this evolution really over the last like two years, like we said, and some of the biggest takeaways you've had from it. Did you say evolution or did you say hovolution? I think you said hovolution. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, I, I wholeheartedly agree. Uh, I think that the, the progression of tools has been re is is a is a is a um is an exponential curve at the moment and i think that the the release of new features i mean it, it's nearly always been impossible to keep up with all the new things that hubspot is constantly releasing in terms of new features but i think the expansion of which business units you can use hubspot for and how you can apply them has really kicked off in the last few years i think that for me it all kind of ties back to how HubSpot are positioning, positioning themselves in the market. Um, I think that traditionally they were that marketing platform. In fact, if, if I remember correctly, and please someone fact check me on this if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure Salesforce was an investor back in, like way back in the day um, in, in HubSpot. Um, I think that when they migrated out of that and started to move into this more kind of CRM focused uh, sales hub, side of things which which they have they have admitted is their kind of focus at the moment um is i think as they've moved out of that um they started as like an smb platform like a growth platform something you could grow with something you can kind of work on as a small organization and what we've really seen and 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 what we've what, what we champion at rev partners is that gone are the days of Salesforce is the enterprise CRM and HubSpot is the SMB CRM. The tools that they now have at their disposal and the tools that you have at your disposal through using HubSpot means that they're now playing on a pretty even playing field. And actually, whereas the argument for hey, HubSpot is the SMB platform was, was probably accurate five, six years ago, it's just not anymore. And anybody that's still making that argument it's likely due to a lack of understanding of just how far HubSpot's come in the last few years. I, I think that the important thing there though, like to your point is, I don't think it's five years. Like I think it's, I honestly think that this change is like very, very, very recent. And the viability yeah. of building this stuff on, on HubSpot is a very new thing. And I think there's a lot of benefits that, that come with that on the things that HubSpot does really, really well. But I, I worry because I think that there's kind of this like, oh, you're behind the times view. And I don't think that that's true. I think that like, we're very much talking about very new, very recent changes. And you don't have, I think the same way that you looked at like, when people were doing a lot of the Marketo work and they were saying, oh, well, Marketo is the only platform that's like legitimate that is customizable and can do the things that you want to do. And that was because you had like executives who they're, the last time they built stuff, like Marketo was the only option. That's what they knew. And I think that happened in the HubSpot marketing world. And I don't think we've seen that change happen yet on the CRM side because this change is so recent. You don't have people that's like, no, 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 I built this. I ran it. It worked. I can point to it. And it's been a while since I was hands on keyboard, but like, I'm confident that this is possible. That age growth hasn't happened yet. Yes, I agree. That's I, very I, true. I, that's trying very to put true. that into like graph terms, like, or like change curve terms. It, we are not close to the peak of this change curve. Like we're still towards the bottom of the well in a sense that like, there is still a lot of change to happen and adoption to happen on that curve. One thing I'd love to hear, uh, and I just opened a poll for everybody uh, on the webinar, we want to hear from you. Are you using HubSpot as your CRM or Salesforce as your CRM or other, and maybe you're here because you're thinking about switching. Um, while that poll's running, I'll, I'll add to that, Connor, I'll, I'll add an interesting uh, you know, purview of it. For a long time, especially in, in high growth tech that a lot of folks here are in, you always heard this like kind of phrase, like you kind of start on HubSpot and you're going to graduate one day and you're going to move on up to uh, to Salesforce. A, a buddy of mine, an investor, uses that graduation terminology, or let me say it differently, he used to. Uh, and the way he's thinking about it now is, you know, when, when they go and invest in a new company, um, you know, they're, they're stage agnostic, so they'll do seed all the way through uh, you know, pre-IPO companies. But he used to always say like, all right, you just got that Series A check. It's time for you to, to graduate and let's go spend some of that money with a great consulting partner to shift you off of HubSpot and on to Salesforce. He said it's not the case as much anymore. And I think that is such a testament to what has happened over the last 18 months and that you get to see so much more flexibility 
of custom objects just being one of them but just again much wider range of how to go and uh and really accomplish what you're trying to seek out and it's leveling up that graduation bar in my opinion or maybe there is no graduation bar i think that's what's going to be forward now what we're going to start seeing is that even a bar or is that even part of the conversation which i'll say takes us right into the fun second part uh i don't know i don't think my uh, my question actually worked on it but um David versus Goliath in this one. Is there room for both? How do we start to think about companies that can leverage both? And again, we'll we'll keep away to a certain degree from the HubSpot marketing side and keep the CRM focused because I think that's what a lot of people want to hear about. But how are you thinking about that in a, in a world where you know companies are evaluating? Everybody's evaluating software right now for a lot of different reasons, some because of market conditions, some because of still growth. But when you think about a little bit of a David versus Goliath, how do you think about the space that they're all in, the market share that everybody's trying to seek. And uh, is there room for both? Will, I'll let you uh, kick this one off. Um, That's a really interesting question. I think that if I could rephrase it, the, the way that I see these two interacting is there is always going to be a transitionary period. There is always going to be a need for the connection between HubSpot and Salesforce. That may look like I don't know, two organizations who are merging, one has Salesforce, one has HubSpot. The understanding of how these two platforms work together is always going to be required. And similarly, as we are seeing this wave of people migrating from the the legacy CRM systems over to HubSpot, that isn't an overnight switch, right? That is something that, that, that happens, needs to be managed, needs to be moved through. So I think that there is space in which they need to be able to play together nicely. They need to be able to be managed and work together nicely. I think I think where where my question is coming in more and more is if you are a new company, if you're a company that is deciding on a CRM soft uh, software product at the very beginning, you're a growth company, you have never really had any sort of real CRM structure for what is becoming less and less of an argument for me these days is is why you would choose Salesforce in that instance over HubSpot just because of the ability for it to scale with you. I think that Salesforce has always had, it's always been, one of its biggest weaknesses has always been its ability to scale alongside you and the kind of high level of investment you need to put into it, especially traditionally. Whereas HubSpot's ability to grow and packaging and all that kind of stuff really does mean that it is becoming more of a no-brainer. I think the space is there for them to play together in those edge cases, but I would really question if there is ever going to be a use case at someone's organization that couldn't now be dealt with by HubSpot, which has always been the main argument of Salesforce is, oh, I need this functionality. Mm-hmm. I challenge anyone to name a functionality now that isn't achievable within HubSpot. There may be one or two, but realistically, I think how many companies I don't, are actually going to need strongly that? strongly disagree. I think there's dozens. I think there are things that HubSpot <laughs> is really, really good at. And I think that the attitude that, oh, Salesforce is terrible. It doesn't do these things. HubSpot's the future, I think, is is totally this I, this position that I think isn't taking into account that like Salesforce is to this day, one of the most powerful enterprise grade applications that exists full stop. And there's things that Salesforce does that HubSpot cannot do today. And that gap gets lower and lower every day. I like, I think HubSpot's actively pushing in that direction, but the way that we usually think about it, and we see, we work with lots of organizations that use both platforms. In fact, the HubSpot Salesforce integration is the best Salesforce integration of any product on the market full stop. And I think Salesforce is moving more and more to being a uh, data storage company. That's like, we have the data model, we have the infrastructure, we're managing for IT and ops, and we're like maintaining these rule sets and these infrastructures. And then HubSpot is coming up on top and saying, we have this orchestration tool. And that's how they did it on the marketing functionality is they went and said, keep all this data in, in Salesforce. We can help you action it. We can help you leverage it. We can help you mobilize it. And they're now doing that with service hub. So now you can sync cases into tickets. Salesforce does not have feedback surveys, customer satisfaction, CSATs, all of the different components on the HubSpot side that you have out of the box on their their service hub. And they're now saying, hey, if you use Salesforce, 
plug us in and we add all this functionality and they have catch up room to happen on the database side. But the database layer is the part that's the easiest to capture and build workarounds for and solve for. And what happens to those end users is ultimately that you give them a worse functionality that doesn't help them do their job because mm -hmm. you're solving for the IT administration. And what we're seeing organizations work towards is not, I don't need a top down control system that says, these are the fields you can fill out. This is the screen you can go through. Like if you're trying to build a call center, so the example I always give is like, if, you, if you're calling for phone support and they're like, okay, which model of phone do you have? Like Verizon, like, are you on an iPhone? Are you on an Android? Are you on a Google phone? Like which one? And then you click one and it takes you to the next screen. Like you should build that function on Salesforce full stop. It is the best product to do a top down rat mazy type of control to guide a user through a specific set of screens. There's no comparison. But yeah. if you're looking at how do I equip and enable highly paid sales marketing service people that are their goal is to deliver a customer experience hubsot is going to help you deliver that experience better than you're going to be able to do a salesforce and it depends on what you're trying to solve for and in which one of those use cases totally i i i do concede that point that if you approach it from a technical standpoint there are there are uh definitely th there's differences these these yeah. two things exist separately right I'm going to rephrase my previous statement, which is that time and time again, we have people from where we're sitting, enterprise organizations, growth organizations, various different organizations who have created complex in a system that, is, that does not need to be complex. They have, they have generated these technical requirements because it's possible. And the... The number of times that we've been able to challenge someone into a, okay, but what does this functionality give you above and beyond the adoption benefits of HubSpot? Realistically, most of those use cases, actually the, the deficit that does exist doesn't make up for the inability for it to grow alongside you. So let I, I will I will concede that my last statement may have been a little bit too overreaching. <laughs> and to rephrase that, what I mean by that is that the for the vast majority of use cases that you are trying to do technically, there are a few edge cases in which you could theoretically do that but the benefits do not outweigh the positive uh, the benefits do not outweigh the negatives and time and time again we are seeing more and more people realize that and understand now that from the off it may be a better option to to go with hubspot i hope that clarifies my position i may have been a little bit gung-ho with my with yeah. my uh with my <laughs> uh love of hubspot in that moment I'm, hey man, I'm here for it. I love it. Uh, <laughs> we're going we're gonna to switch over to questions real quick because we're seeing a lot come through the chat and Q&A. Uh, if you have a really good question, drop in the Q&A because we can promote it up here on the screen like we just did. And Sergey, thank you for, uh, for asking. As a consultant, this is a fantastic uh, question for both of you and I'll let uh, either one of you jump in after the question. As a consultant, how do you handle scenarios when some basic functionality that exists in Salesforce just cannot be delivered via HubSpot. Things like validation rules, condition field rendering, and dynamic forms, et cetera. Would you like to start this one or do you want me to? Who's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that? I've got some thoughts, but I'm going to let you guys start us off. I think um, for us, it's a, as I was just saying, for us, I think it's about questioning those processes and 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 why those processes exist internally at the organization i think that for us the most important element of a crm is the adoption of those processes and we see so many failed implementations of pre-existing pre-existing legacy implementations that when we are approaching a new, a net new instance in which someone is asking us, we need to achieve X within HubSpot. I think that 
Oxhub has taken huge amounts, huge leaps forward and be able to enable us to be able to do some of these things. Um, we do still do quite a lot of custom integrations at Rev Partners in order to make up for some of those really edge case technical uh, technical requirements. But most of the time, the requirement that's being asked of us can be thought about in a different way and achieve the same end goal. And I think that's where a lot of this functionality needs to come down into a, do we really need this? Is there another way of achieving this? And if the answer to those two things is is ultimately that like you really do need that thing, there then becomes a question of does does the benefits of this outweigh the potential for this whole project to fail just purely because the adoption is so much lower than it would be if it was on HubSpot. So I think that there are always edge cases. Um, there are ways around building that within HubSpot when it comes to custom integrations or particularly Ops Hub these days. But I would always question the necessity for these kind of complex requirements within the CRM. Totally. Connor, what do you just think? Just build it. <laughs> like, yeah, like <laughs> legitimately, that's my answer. Like, you don't have, yeah. HubSpot doesn't have a, the, I would say the validation rule engine in Salesforce is one of the most robust and powerful features, right? So when we talk about that, like rat mazy type of, I want to control and top down process enforcement, Salesforce is better at that than HubSpot is like full stop. If that's the problem you're trying to solve, HubSpot is a bad solution to that problem. The contention that I would give is not just similar to what, what Will's saying, which is that if the primary thing you're trying to do is I need to top down, build a rat maze control system for a series of agents that are only going to go through this distinct flow and this distinct process and it's hyper rigid and we can sit in a room, we can design that process, we can implement that process, we can deploy it to those users and say, here's how it works. Salesforce is great. I think what we're seeing is increasingly that's not the problem that companies are trying to solve. In fact, that's something that holds them back and it makes them slower. And you can get the level of functionality that you need inside of HubSpot with certainty, especially like, I think as Will's saying, like enterprise companies are very rarely buying a CRM for the first time. Like they usually have something and they're usually looking at moving, migrating, rebuilding, reconfiguring. That's why they're looking at something like a HubSpot is because they have pain and the validation rule system, there is no Salesforce user that has not tried to go do a thing gotten thrown big red warnings, clicked yep. a bunch of fields to try to get through it and hit save. And then someone's wondering why all their reporting is bad. And it's because the sales users are just punching things into fields so they can get to the next screen so they can solve their problem. And you can bring a lot of that functionality into HubSpot. You can require fields at different stages of any objects. You can have, you can also like the extensibility functionality. So when we think about mm. like you have in here, conditional field rendering, dynamic forms, like all those pieces, you can take CMS Hub and anything you can build on the web product, full stop, like not, not Salesforce UI builder, anything you want to build that's a web application, you can embed it directly into any record on, on HubSpot. You can open that record. It contextualizes with which record you're coming in from, and you can build an entire extensible experience for whatever rat mazy control UI data entry you want under the sun, and you can build it. So the answer is there is, we can build any of those pieces and the configurator component of it gets stronger and stronger and stronger. But I think that there's an element of let's solve for how we can equip that user to do their job better versus let's only give the user a couple of buttons that they're allowed to push. And if your primary problem you're trying to solve is give a user a couple of buttons, they kind of push, go use retool, go use bubble, build like a purpose-built application for it. Like CRM is not a great place to build that thing anymore. And I think that there's better ways to solve that problem. I agree. I'm not going to go all uh, all Spider-Man on anybody, but like with great power comes great responsibility. If you want to repurpose that in something similar to, look, Salesforce is wildly flexible, but I'll tell you with that flexibility also comes some heartburn. And I can tell you from conversations I've had with our customers, orgs that I've had to manage, just because the flexibility to build something and to configure it, whether it's validation rules, whether it's flows, Apex, whatever, that's not always the best thing. There's there's purpose built software similar to HubSpot and just like HubSpot, where we want to limit some of that functionality or limit a little bit of that just for the better sake of the end user side of it. Because again, you can build and build and build and build and 
I can tell you I've looked at mountains of tech debt inside of some Salesforce orgs because of the flexibility to build. So just on that on that functionality note, that's always been my take. Just because just you can build it doesn't mean you should. Yes, absolutely. So um, um, by the way, I'm really sorry. Uh, sorry to, dis uh, to, to derail the service so slightly. If you hear any feedback, I really apologize. My headphones have died. So oh. um, if you hear any feedback, <laughs> I apologize because I'm now using a speaker. You are totally fine. You sound great. So you're, uh, you're in good shape. So the next question I want to add, and I'll, I'll toss it up on the screen. How do we start thinking about scale here? Because so much of this, again, we're, we're going to remove that old adage of, oh, man, we got to start here, but we're definitely going to uh, migrate up or migrate off. How do we start to think about the actual scale of this? Uh, any advice there? Because it's it's a tough thing to think about when you're buying software now and you're typically in a one year, two year, sometimes a three year deal. Is the purchase that I'm making right now, the solution I have going to be here for me through the longevity of that? Um, how are you all seeing that with some of your customers? And uh, Connor, I'll let you kick it off. Yeah, I mean, I think that the, so my first exposure to HubSpot on the CRM side uh, was, at a, I was, operating partner of Venture Studio in Chicago, we were putting all of our companies and we were doing what we talked about earlier, right? Like we literally be like, hey, let's set it all up on HubSpot because you don't know what you want. You don't have any money. We don't have time to figure this out. Like just put it on HubSpot and then we'll we'll move it over. Uh, and I think that graduation date as you're thinking about it moves further and further and further and further and further into the future. And today where that graduation point I think sits is when you have a hyper complex requirement for data security, data permissions, sharing, like global companies start to have a lot of pain. Cause I have, I have regions, I have currencies, I have languages, like, and that's the kind of stuff that Salesforce excels at. HubSpot has multi-language. They have some business unit functionality. You can do some of that, but really specific data controls is really where you start to graduate off of today. And mm -hmm. We come into some of these deals with very large sale global organizations. It's like, listen, like we think we could do this, but if that's a core problem that you guys have, I think you're going to have a bad time. But six months ago, that problem was I needed to build some custom application inside of the CRM that would extend what it's capable of. And we were like, yeah, I mean, if you need to do that, you're probably going to have to look somewhere else. Then that went away. And six months before that, it was, I need objects that represent more than the ones that we already have and don't fit into my data model. And then that went away. And I think that we're seeing that parity. And I think the parity equation... Parity is not like building validation rules as like the thing that people, like people used to be like, oh, HubSpot doesn't have custom objects, isn't real. And then we had that. Like, like we're getting down this list of things that go from like hard to build to like pretty easy to build. Like, I, and the question is like, why is HubSpot doing it? But like, it doesn't take 50 engineers six months to build out validation rules. Like this is not some crazy complicated thing to do. And I think a lot of those things are getting resolved. And the more interesting component is, almost philosophical and intentional. And I think we're seeing really large organizations. I saw someone in here post something about like, oh, let's see what HubSpot does with millions of records. Like we have a major cruise line as a customer and they're all on HubSpot and they have tens of millions of records inside of their HubSpot platform. And the search is like instantaneous. They can access these things. Things aren't getting archived. Like you, you can absolutely do that. You're not going to be running into volume limits like the only things you're going to run into is a core function that i need is a feature hubspot doesn't have and the number of those features that exist gets smaller and smaller and smaller every single i just saw david comment connor's best i appreciate that david <laughs> was at lucid press who's now mark and they were one of the first big large scale crm implementations that we saw on the hubspot platform and like i think now like the things that we did for them then are like so basic compared to what you can do now and the speed at which that's happening is seriously wild. Yeah, I love it, I love it. Will, what do you think as well on the on the adoption side and scale side of this? I, I yeah, I wholeheartedly agree. I think that um, to answer your, to answer your, your, the second part of your question, which was how are we seeing people deal with this question of HubSpot v Salesforce and the adoption of it and the scale of it and whether or not people are moving on to it. In all honesty, we're seeing that question a lot less and less. Like this is this is this is part of why we have this ethos of of like the orange wave is that the instances in which people are coming to us and saying we're deciding between HubSpot and Salesforce are dropping dr like dramatically, yeah. and that is kind of why we are so confident in where HubSpot is going. And I think part of that reason is that 
we we do deal with enterprise level companies but the vast majority of the people that come to us tend to be in that kind of growth smb moving up into enterprise side of things and we 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 do get this question sometimes and i think to to kind of hop back to connor's point like if you are starting on hubspot now i in the next few years as this as this platform continues to grow, especially if it continues to grow at the rate that it is currently in terms of functionality, I that gap that Connor's talking about, that functionality dropping and saying, oh, well, six months ago it had to be this and now that's gone. And then six months ago it had to be that and now that's gone. Those moments are just going to keep coming. And so if you're starting now on HubSpot, I think that the scalability of it is only going to increase over mm. the next few years. And so, yes, there's a question around, should you migrate from Salesforce to HubSpot? Of course, there's that question. But if you're deciding straight off, like, do I have Salesforce or do I have HubSpot? That scalability is just getting further and further into the distance. That graduation point is getting further and further and further into the distance. And so it then becomes that question of, the scalability is likely going to be there, even if it's not there now. Totally. I, I think to echo Will's point, I mean, if you're early stage and you're trying to figure it out, I think HubSpot becomes the de facto and people look at Salesforce later. Like we don't really have those conversations. Like we don't really serve that segment. I think uh, if you're a large organization, we, we have a lot of like, should I go Salesforce or should I go HubSpot is the number one conversation. We have. That is why we talk to people is they're like, I don't know if we can do what we want to do on Salesforce. And I know these SMBs can do it, but can we? And that's the number one conversation we have. And the number one thing that we do, if you're in that situation, we're happy to talk to you. But what we're yeah. seeing more increasingly and what I'm more excited about is not like HubSpot becoming this de facto at the SMB layer. It's we're seeing more and more large scale organizations that run everything on Salesforce and pay a ton of money to Salesforce, pay a ton of money to an in-house team to support it, pay a ton of money to consultants to keep it running, can't build fast enough, can't iterate fast enough, their users can't get things done. And they start to say, okay, this hurts and I can't get the things I need to get working, working. And I pay for all of this other stuff, whether it's outreach or sales loft or uh what's the other um, scratch pad or gong or whatever I'm buying to like try to make Salesforce work. And I spend a ton of money to try to make Salesforce work. What if I didn't have to do that? And that's, that's the segment that I think we're seeing that happen. We're seeing that change. And that's where things get really exciting. And I think we are at the very early days of that shift happening. And more and more of those organizations are going to be saying, we need to rip out our core organs and put in new ones while we continue to live. Like, can you help us do that? And that's really where we're trying to focus our business around helping companies do that. Totally. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. And I think that, I think that just to, just to kind of jump in here, um, the original question was around, uh, was, was around adoption and scale. Right. <laughs> and I think that that first part is a bit that we've kind of omitted to speak to yet, which is, the reason why people aren't going, when we talk about a failed CRM project, when we talk about something that, that, that isn't working, right? At least from where we're sitting, the vast majority of those isn't working, aren't technical questions. They aren't, they aren't, we need it to do X. It's people aren't using it. We're not seeing the, we're not seeing the data come in. We're not seeing the revenue flow through. And it's usually due to human error. It's usually due to, people wanting to push things through or a lack of a lack of adoption and when you look at it that way it then becomes a question of what is the what what does success mean for us in terms of a CRM implementation or even just not not just implementation just having a CRM right yeah. and to kind of echo uh, Connor's point like if you're paying a lot of money to Salesforce and ultimately your end requirement is not being fulfilled it doesn't matter how technically complex you can make it it doesn't matter how how uh, over the top you could go with it it's better to have 80 percent of the stuff that you really want working and then than to have 20 percent of you don't have to make compromises right? more yeah. importantly yeah i think exactly. that like you might i think it totally makes sense to say for the vast majority of companies like just don't worry about that it's not important and i think that's great and I think if you're larger, like they're like, no, 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 I, I'll pay for it. It's fine. 
Like, but can it do it? And like the answer, I think more importantly is like, it can. It can. Yeah, I agree. We're yeah. going to, uh, we're going to switch over to some fun Q and A. And these are, these questions are great. We're going to try to cruise through them. I know we've got about 10 or so more minutes. Um, keep them coming. Uh, of course, and I'm going to drop some more links in. So everyone here can connect with Will and Connor, uh, especially on LinkedIn. If we can't get to all your questions now, I know we can get to them uh, via LinkedIn and email and everything like that. So please, please, please connect with everybody. But Dan asked a really good question. And I love this really from our community perspective, because this is what we're here to do is elevate each other in our careers and make sure that we're able to sit here and get shit done the right way. So when you think about this as a career move, you know, for someone building their career in rev ops and sales ops and anything system configuration, would you recommend learning Salesforce if you primarily use HubSpot and is knowing HubSpot enough to have that vibrant and successful career? I, I think so. Uh, so to answer the question, cause it's too part, I don't want to, I don't want to be ambiguous with this. Uh, yeah. I think it is enough to just know HubSpot these days. That doesn't mean that the, the, having that extra string to your bow, knowing Salesforce is going to be a bad thing. Um, I think that we have historically seen that the title, the job title of Salesforce admin has been a thing that has been around for such a long time, right? Like the idea of being a Salesforce admin is kind of concreted. Whereas it's relatively recently that the idea of being a HubSpot admin is even a thing. So what I would say is um, there's a there's a great community called Sprocketeer, um, which is for HubSpot admins specifically and championing the role of HubSpot admins in this space. So please join Sprocketeer if you if you uh, if you pass yourself or, or want to become a HubSpot admin. Um, to to answer the question, I think that it's it's always going to be useful to know how those two things work and how and particularly how they how they work together. But I also think that it is a totally valid route now to choose HubSpot as your primary knowledge area. And I think that this orange wave it means that there will be the opportunities to back up that career progression. More and more people are going to go over to HubSpot and the requirement for HubSpot admins is just going to go up. And I think it's a really exciting place to be. I think it's going to be, there's going to be more opportunity for people that, that class themselves as, Hub, as, as HubSpot experts. Totally. I mean, look, I, I can tell you right now, even some of the ways that you can learn more about it now is becoming more and more robust. A good friend of mine on the, the webinar, Brenna, uh, is in charge of that over at HubSpot. And a lot of this learning and community involvement to make sure that people can find the right answers. Uh, as they want. We're going to move quickly through some of these questions. Can I take uh, a very quick pass at this? That'll be Yeah, totally. Fast. Go for it. I was going to say. David kind of already gave my point in the chat, but uh, my, my answer is I think you can absolutely build a career with only HubSpot knowledge. Uh, I think that's totally possible. Um, what I would say is if you have HubSpot knowledge and you can expand and understand the Salesforce side, the majority of HubSpot users have it connected to Salesforce today. That's going down over time. Uh, mm -hmm. But more and more, the opportunity set is not in helping some company being like, hey, we've never used anything. What should we do? Let's use HubSpot. Let's go get that set up. Like, I think that becomes smaller and smaller potatoes. And what gets really big on the career side is if you can help and come and understand the way someone's Salesforce organization works and how they have it set up and be able to speak that language and understand it, you are going to be more equipped to be able to help them translate that. And it's kind of like saying, should I learn, you know, I shouldn't use French, but like, should, should I learn Spanish or Mandarin? And you're like, I mean, either is great. There's tons of people that speak it. You can totally do it. But if you know Spanish and Mandarin, boy, does that get really interesting or English and Mandarin. And I think that's really the way to think about it is get fluent in one. It's a really good idea. Uh, and if you can get somewhat fluent in the other one, you're going to be able to help people at a degree that, that other folks just can't. Totally. I, I completely agree. Yeah. If, if you're sharpening your sword, Keep it sharp on both sides. I mean, let's let's make sure that your 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 skill set should be something that is robust enough to solve the problems for your company or for your customers. Keep it centric to that. This one's gonna be fun for me. My good friend Megan Fletcher just asked this. So, uh, and her and I were catching up earlier this week about some of the Chat GPT uh, things that are happening. I'd love to get both of y'all's takes here. Will Chat GPT be learning HubSpot for AI power configuration? Maybe it's already happening. Have y'all seen this yet in the in this part of the ecosystem? Yeah. yeah, I mean, I mean we're, we're Darmesh, writing... yeah, go for Sorry, it. go on, mate. I was just going to say, Darmesh has created Chatspot. Uh, like, Chatspot is a thing that is coming. It is on the horizon. It 
it will make the adoption even more easy <laughs> even easier sorry that's better that's better grammar even easier than uh than before like this is something that is coming um chat gpt specifically the way that i approach chat gpt is that it is a fantastic tool it is getting better i don't think it's going to be the end all i think it's this is a, this is a hunch this is not this is not guarantee but i think it's going to be the ask jeeves of the of the uh, search engine world. I think that something's gonna come along and do it better. Um, but I think right now it's one of those things that is a great tool to increase the efficiency of what of how you work. And I think that there are many use cases that we have found for using ChatGPT within HubSpot. Uh, even simple things like explaining concepts and those sorts of things is, is it's a, it is a great tool, um, but if you're interested in that kind of stuff and you want to know, then do check out Chats because um, because that is that is coming and it's going to be really exciting. Totally, Connor, are you seeing it as well? Yeah, I, I uh, Chatspot's cool and interesting. I think what I've learned from uh, talking with the team that's running it is they're looking at it more as a we're building a Chat GPT function that is designed for like sales marketers and service people, and we like want to give it more context than Chat GPT does. Um, I'm like a big AI nerd and advocate and the things that you can do right now are insane. So like, I'll give you an example of where I think where, what we're doing. So like first, what we're doing right now, right now, we are having our team go to GPT-4 and say, I want a custom coded action that is going to work in HubSpot and it will trigger when deals are marked close one, here are the field names that are in my deal. And I would like to create an order in NetSuite by looking up the NetSuite company based off of this ID. And I would like that to run. And can you write that for me in JavaScript? And it will give you back a workable piece of code that you can copy. You can paste into a coded action. You can swap an authentication code and it runs and it works. That's right now. That exists today. What's so next cool. and is not a difficult extrapolation is the interface for that level of automation and that level of functionality moves directly into HubSpot itself. So when you go and you set up a workflow action, you just write, I would like to connect something to NetSuite and I would like it to do these things. And it will set it up and it'll do it and it'll troubleshoot itself with AutoGPT. It'll make sure that it works and it'll turn itself on and it'll say, okay, cool, that's done now. And that already, Zapier, what, this week was like, you can write in natural language and we'll output custom code. So like that's happening. And I think the end result of this is that, and it, for because this is Wizards of Ops, I'll do like my... I'll rally and cry that I'm giving to everyone in our organization, which is today you can build a career and you can become a valuable person that makes a bunch of money and is employed by companies with the knowledge that just says, I can take what a business user says that they want to have happen and I can turn that and I into a report or an automation and I can give that to them. And that's my job. That is my skill set. That skill set is no longer valuable. That skill set is the equivalent of knowing how to type. And there used to be typists that reported to executives and their job was to type up meeting notes, gone, dead, adios. So like, I think the era of the admin, the person of the configurator, the person who points and clicks and manages the buttons and knows how the machine works, all of that goes away because any business user that can declaratively tell the machine what it wants will just get what they want on the other side. And so I think mm -hmm. for anyone in the ops space, you need to be moving towards architecture, strategy, and process, because those are the only things that will matter and the only things that exist. And those become the, the thing that becomes a force multiplier for the impact of the AI and knowing what buttons to click, which is like a large percentage of what people do today, all becomes irrelevant because no one needs to know where the buttons are. You just tell the machine what you want it to do. Yeah, totally. It, There's it a phrase bad. that uh, AI isn't going to replace you, but people using AI will which is that ex essentially that concept of like, if you can get, if you can learn how, to, if you can learn the skills that AI can't do and utilize AI to do those things, that is what's really going to make the big impact. Totally. So it, it, it does come down to a, almost a dog eat dog world into where like you either embrace it or it's going to kind of eat you, I guess, if you will, but you have to be able to be. It's also super exciting. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to jump in. Um, it's also it's also super exciting. Like um, people always people have this fear about about losing jobs to 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 AI and all those sorts of things. But they're the same fears that that people had when 
we started using mass manufacturing in the early 1900s, late, late 1800s, early 1900s. Yeah. It's like, it's the same thing. There were a bunch of people on a, on a production line and they got replaced by robots and everyone was worried that there would never be a thing. And the idea of revenue operations, even 20 years ago, people didn't really focus in it. Like we are, we are seeing constant evolution. And I think it's impossible to predict what it is that the job world is going to look like in 20, 30 years. We can make, we can make educated guesses, but ultimately it is, it is an opportunity as much as it is a, a scary coming for our jobs moment. Totally. You should be using it to make your job better and you better at your job. And if you can't, then let's talk about that differently. But yes, that's how you need to be thinking about it. We'll get one more question. Good friend Ian Shields jumping in. Uh, I love this. Is HubSpot poised to help organizations with PLG and enterprise sales and community growth? We're all seeing a lot of these different go-to-market strategies now. You know, and if so, what HubSpot features are scalable and robust? Uh, and what features or functions HubSpot is missing or aren't, in fact, scalable or robust? A uh, lot to answer there. Uh, I'll let Connor jump in first, and then we'll bring us home. Sure. Uh, I, I can take maybe the PLG thing first. I, I actually think that this is a good example where if you are a PLG driven company, HubSpot is better for you than Salesforce is. Uh, and the reason for that is like the core of HubSpot being built around the marketing product means the core of HubSpot is built around the contact and they have very natural extensibility into all of their analytics functions, right? So you think of like the Google analytics element of they viewed this page, they clicked this button, they took this action, they had this app. Piping that data into Salesforce is hard, right? You end up putting it on fields, you're putting it into an activity timeline, maybe you build another object. We see a lot of like user object or account object related to that, that contact. When you're in HubSpot, you have the activity timeline, you can do custom behavioral events, you can pipe all of this in, you can build scoring models around it, you can use all that data to trigger workflows and, and you can populate emails or messages with context that's getting fed in from that. I, I think if you're a PLG organization, there's a very strong argument that HubSpot is going to be a better CRM platform for you because it's going to be much easier to integrate with your product, but more importantly, it's gonna be much powerful when it's integrated with your product versus trying to do it with Salesforce. And we see like whether you're doing Pendo or Mixpanel or whatever, and you're piping everything over way harder. HubSpot, super easy, super powerful. You literally add the tracking code into your web analytics. You start firing off custom events. Like you have a full Pendo combined with your CRM infrastructure. It's rad. Uh, and I think in those types of examples, HubSpot's actually better at that. And you can start to manage, you know, multiple pipelines and some of these other pieces and, uh, be able to track a lot of those different conversion elements and, and how you manage a lot of those pieces. But I think if you're doing PLG or really anything where uh, your primary growth engine is not outbound or in-person sales, uh, and you can do those things also. I'm not saying you can't, but if you're doing a different growth strategy, HubSpot's probably better at it than than Salesforce is. I, I, I agree with you. Will, what do you think? Yeah, um, to stay on the PLG, mo uh, the PLG motion side of things just for a second, it's also a natural progression for people who already use HubSpot for marketing. Mm -hmm. um, we have we have quite a few uh, partners who use HubSpot for marketing. Maybe use a different different tool, uh, different platform. Maybe it's Salesforce. Maybe it's something else to manage the kind of sales sales portion of their PLG led motion. And actually, they it is such a natural progression to still have that marketing lead into the revenue side of things when it comes to PLG motions that, yeah, it is, it is a really natural space for HubSpot to sit in. Um, just to discuss the other side of things as well. I think that the overarching theme here when it comes to enterprise sales uh, and uh, I can't speak so much about community growth, but particularly when it comes to enterprise sales, the overarching theme with this entire conversation is that the gap between the two is getting less and less and less. And the use cases that actually make sense, the, the, the use cases that, 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 that most companies actually need it, are now fully achievable within enterprise sales, uh, within, within HubSpot sales hub. And that I think has really come about because of their focus on on sales hub over the last few years there is a reason why we here at rev partners focus on sales sales hub 
and revenue operations as opposed to marketing is because we see that opportunity within HubSpot and we see the growth within HubSpot. So I can't really speak to the community growth side of things. It's not something we've done a huge amount of work in. Um, however, we are seeing a lot of chatter around that area and some really interesting use cases come out of it. I think that it's one of those things that for us, it feels like it's probably not native yet. It doesn't feel like you're doing things within HubSpot in the way it's supposed to be intended to, but also it is achieving what a lot of community growth people are trying to achieve. And I get this knowledge from places like Sproperteer and those sort of places. Totally. Totally. I love it. This is so cool. I, I know we've got about five minutes left, so we're going to do a little bit of rapid fire and then sadly we all get to get back to our days because I know we all have busy days to go to. But uh, bringing this back towards the center of our community, because that's exactly why we put these on. We want everybody in our greater operations and consulting world to thrive in their current roles or in their future roles. It's my favorite question. I ask it to everybody I have uh, when they come on. But any advice? Very quick. Tweet worthy link. What's your best advice for anybody here listening and especially going to watch the recording for them to be growing in their ops and consulting career, whether it be on the HubSpot focus, the Salesforce focus, both or new focuses? We've all been there, right? We have, we have been on this journey and we're still on it. You both wouldn't be here and be successful in your both uh, respective places if you didn't have some good advice along the way. Connor, I'm going to start with you. Some quick advice for uh, folks growing in their ops career. Sure. Uh, I'm scrolling up because there's somebody in the chat who asked, like, what's the best way to go from admin to like strategy and, and technical and architecture and some of the other pieces? Um, my advice is that being good at anything comes down to reps. Uh, and the best way to get reps is to work inside of an organization that is doing big, complicated, technical upmarket stuff. Uh, and in the Salesforce universe, there's lots and lots and lots of options. In the HubSpot universe, there's few. Uh, but I think that's the right answer uh, is if you can go and work in an organization that is building complex, interesting things, you will get more reps than you ever will being in-house somewhere managing an existing system. And if you're in the field building and that's the primary thing you're doing, you're going to get so much better, so much faster, and you're going to be building things on the bleeding edge. And that's the best way to do it. I couldn't agree more. Go, go educate yourself. Be part of that bleeding edge and be ready to roll your sleeves up and do it. Don't be afraid or timid of it. Love that, Connor. Will, what do you think? This might be a fairly, uh, fairly um, uh, awkward one, but uh, so this is said with no slight towards people in the hospitality industry whatsoever. I used to work in the hospitality industry, but we have a we have a phrase at Rev Partners which is "think like a doctor, not like a waiter." So rather than having someone come to you and think and say, these are the things that we need, bring them to us, please, right? These are the things that need to happen, build it. Rather than thinking in that way, try to think much more like a doctor of what are the symptoms that we're seeing and how do we alleviate those symptoms? What's the best way to alleviate those symptoms? That's speaking specifically around the kind of like strategic, how you get into the strategic side of things. I think being curious is the most important trait for anyone that wants to get into the strategic side of things. And it's actually a skill that you can learn. A lot of people think it's like something that you have to naturally be good at strategy. The, the word why is the most useful word in the world when you're working in, in consultation. Just ask why every single time they give you an answer and you will get more information than you can possibly imagine. So that's that's my advice for getting to the consulting strategy side of things. Um, and to be honest, kind of kind of kind of already covered the 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 ops side of things. Get involved, yeah. work on really complex projects, um, and try and position yourself in one of those positions where you can kind of get your your hand dirty. Um, and don't be afraid to uh, to move fast and break things. Like you learn more from your failures than you do from from your successes a lot of the time. Absolutely. I think the, the one thing I'll bring us home on this, because I, I like to tell people this all the time, it's part of my interview process. If you're going to come you know, work with us, I'm, I'm going to test you on this. But I say it in the best way of advice for folks growing in their career. Embrace the words, I don't know. I always push folks as I'm interviewing them to get to that point, And nobody can know everything. That's impossible. But the minute you can embrace those three words, the next set of words that typically come out are, no, but I've got a great community of folks that I know I can find the answer with. Or I've got rock stars like 
Will and Connor that I know I can ping and say, hey, how do I, how are y'all thinking about this? So embrace those words, be humble, but follow them quickly with finding the right answer. And I wish somebody had told me that a decade ago. I'm sure I've probably been a little bit better off than I am now somehow. But uh, yeah, always say the words. I don't know. It's, it's perfectly fine to do it. Uh, guys, we're right at the top of the hour. Can't thank you both enough. This has been so fun. Uh, just personally speaking, Connor, it's been so fun watching you build uh, Aptitude 8 and Happily. And this is going to be a, a great journey for you. Uh, Will, I didn't say it at the beginning, but I have to say it now. Congrats on the recent promotion. Uh, very excited for you. And uh, everything you and the Red Partners are doing. Uh, you guys are both rock stars. Our community wouldn't be here without y'all. Can't thank you enough. So hope everybody has a great rest of their day. We'll get the recording out for this and be sure to connect with everybody. This has uh, been super fun and stay tuned. We've got more coming along the way. Take thank care. You, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Absolutely. Have a good rest of your day.